It is the intention of an unelected plutocracy and their puppets that the socially destructive aims of the Paris Agreement will be further developed and executed at the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26. A fundamental Paris Agreement premise that lies at the core of its arguments is currently being promoted by the organisers of COP26. It is that the Earth's climate is changing from a good and normal climate to a warmer, abnormal and alarming climate and needs to be restored to its previous state. This statement has absolutely no basis in climate science. That is why one of the aims of this community is to dismantle the various climate change fallacies that are being and will be promoted at COP26. We will now demonstrate that the very idea of a stable, normal climate is naive and unscientific. We will look at the unbelievably complex and ever-changing relationship that the Earth has with its main power source, the Sun. To quote the IPCC, the Sun's core is a massive nuclear fusion reactor that converts hydrogen into helium. This process produces energy that radiates throughout the solar system as electromagnetic radiation. Total solar irradiance is a measure of the total energy received from the Sun at the top of the atmosphere. And of course the total solar irradiance TSI is Earth's dominant energy input exceeding the next largest energy source by nearly 10 to the power 4. The IPCC confirms the variability of the climate when it states that TSI varies over a wide range of timescales from billions of years to just a few days. They say changes in solar irradiance are an important driver of climate variability and that the amount of energy striking the top of the Earth's atmosphere varies depending on the generation and emission of electromagnetic energy by the Sun and on the Earth's orbital path around the Sun. We will now focus on that very subject, the Earth's orbital path around the Sun, known as the Milankovitch cycles. These cycles are very complex, but understand in jest the essential components of the Milankovitch cycles will show how absurd it is to believe there ever could be a stable, unchanging, normal climate. But that uninformed claim is the fundamental premise of the Paris Agreement and COP26. Milutin Milankovic was a Serbian engineer. During the 1930s, he worked on a theory of climate based on the variations of solar irradiance received by the Earth. He formulated a comprehensive mathematical model describing the variant cycles of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Milankovic noticed that these cycles correspond to many indicators of past climate change, such as past ice ages. He therefore proposed that the changes in the intensity of solar irradiation received on the Earth were affected by three fundamental factors. These factors are now collectively known as the Milankovitch cycles.
The first Milankovitch cycle is known as eccentricity. A simple model of the Earth's orbit is that we swing around the Sun in a regular manner. But in fact, the orbit varies and fluctuates in complex cycles. In 1609, Johannes Kepler set out three laws. The first law stated that the orbit of the Earth is an ellipse and not a circle, as was believed. We now know that the Earth's orbit is in fact more complex and irregular than a single standard ellipse. The orbit fluctuates from that very close to a circle to that of a more clearly defined ellipse and then gradually reverts to being close to a circle. The extent to which it varies from a circle is known as its eccentricity. Orbital variations occur over very long time periods of between 95,000 to 125,000 years. The fluctuating cycles tend towards a cycle period of 100,000 years. A major variation in the orbit takes place at around 413,000 years. The net effect being that the Earth's orbit around the Sun is in a perpetual cycle of change. Although this diagram gives a flattened view, currently the Earth's orbit is almost a circle. It is at its closest to the Sun in early January, the point known as the perihelion. It is at its furthest distance in early July. This is the aphelion. When we are closest to the Sun, the separating distance is approximately 91 million miles. 146 million kilometers. And when we are furthest from the Sun, the separating distance is roughly 94.5 million miles, 152 million kilometers. This translates into a current difference in the total solar irradiance of only about 6%. When the orbit is at its most eccentric, the separating distance when we are closest to the Sun is approximately 80 million miles, 129 million kilometers. And when we are furthest from the Sun, the separating distance is roughly 116 million miles, 187 million kilometers. This translates into a difference in the total solar irradiance of between 20 to 25 percent. The eccentricity of the Earth's orbit evidently causes changes to the total solar irradiance over long periods of time. But its effect becomes more marked when taken in combination with the other two factors making up the Milankovitch cycles. The next factor we will look at will also explain to those in the Northern Hemisphere why their winters occur when the Earth is at its closest to the Sun. Obliquity has to do with how the Earth spins. It does not spin like this in a vertical manner. Instead, it spins with a tilt the tilt is not constant, it changes over time. Currently, the actual tilt is about 23.5 degrees from the vertical. The full range of obliquity is from 22.1 degrees to 24.5 degrees. To cycle through the full range takes 41,000 years. During that cycle, the tilt 
does have a significant impact on our climate. In the first instance, it explains how we have seasons and why currently the northern hemisphere experiences summer when it is furthest from the sun. If the actual tilt did not exist, then each location on the Earth would experience an almost consistent amount of solar irradiance throughout the annual cycle. There would be a slightly increased solar irradiance when the Earth approached the perihelion, but this would not amount to anything like the seasonal change we currently experience. But because of the factor of obliquity, the northern and southern hemispheres experience varying amounts of solar irradiance as the Earth goes through its orbit. In December, the Earth is almost at the perihelion. Due to the actual tilt, northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun and the southern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. Thus, the sun shines directly on the southern hemisphere, but indirectly on the northern hemisphere. Hence, in December, it is summer south of the equator and winter north of the equator. Moving to March, the sun's rays are more evenly distributed. So it is autumn south of the equator and spring north of the equator. In June, the Earth is almost at the aphelion. Because of the actual tilt, the sun shines directly on the northern hemisphere and indirectly on the southern hemisphere. This provides summer north of the equator and winter south of the equator. A point to note is the tilt of the northern hemisphere more than compensates for the approximate 6% loss in solar irradiance received at the aphelion. In September, the sun once again shines almost equally on the southern and northern hemispheres. This results in autumn north of the equator and spring south of the equator. There are further variances to the seasons and climate. Not only does the angle of obliquity change over the cycle of 41,000 years, but the Earth's orbit is also going through its cycle of change. This means that the average temperature difference between summer and winter in any particular location will also change over time. There will be two extreme periods. The one extreme is where the actual tilt is furthest from the vertical and the perihelion is at its closest to the sun, thus resulting in a maximum of solar irradiance. The other extreme being where the angle of obliquity is closest to the vertical and the aphelion is at its furthest from the sun, thus resulting in a minimum of solar irradiance. We have completed our look at obliquity and the multiple fluctuations in climate it contributes to. We will now move on to the last of Milankovitch's factors, precession. The precession of the Earth is in fact a wobble. It results in the Earth describing a cone over time as it points to different areas of the sky. At around 2017, the axis of the Earth is pointing at Polaris, the North Star. Due to precession, it will gradually arrive at a point where it would be pointing at the star Vega. When this shift does occur, Vega would then be considered the North Star. 
the full cycle of precession, when once again Polaris is considered the North Star, takes around 26,000 years. Earlier we looked at this example of extreme low solar irradiance, where the aphelion is at its greatest distance and the actual tilt is closest to the vertical. When we factor in precession, there will be further variations in the seasons and a further extreme as the cycles of precession and obliquity coincide. One extreme being where precession tilts the Earth even further from the Sun. Another being where precession tilts the Earth closer to the Sun. It must be emphasised that changes to the climate do not occur only at these extremes. They can occur at any point in the cycles as the cycles interact with the numerous and complex and above all chaotic forces that influence our climate. In his studies of the long-term motion of the Earth, Lasker notes that his main difficulty has been with that same chaotic motion of the solar system. This chaotic nature of the solar system and its effect on our climate is of course well known to climate scientists such as Dr. James Hansen who has stated quite clearly that the climate is always changing and thus would agree that there is no such thing as a good and normal climate, as claimed by the Paris Agreement and COP26. In a future video, we will continue to debunk the fallacies supporting the Paris Agreement and show that not only has our planet changed from what it looked like 500 million years ago, to what it looks like now, but also for around the past 800,000 years our planet has gone through cycles of climate change where ice ages have covered the United States and Canada and the United Kingdom and Scandinavia in thick sheets of ice. The ice ages alternated with warmer periods when it was not unusual for ice to disappear from the Arctic and for glaciers to contract. If you would like to join our community, you can log in to locals.com. You can discover our community by searching on Opposing the Paris Agreement or go directly through opposingtheparisagreement.locals.com Dot com.